Hello, my name is Jeff Heaton, and I'm going to take you through the slides for a presentation that I gave to the St. Louis Java Users Group in June of 2013. This presentation is entitled GPU Programming in Java Using OpenCL. As previously mentioned, my name is Jeff Heaton. You can see my basic contact information here with the email, Twitter, blog, and GitHub. All of the code that you will see in this presentation is stored on GitHub. Something else that I am known for is the INCOG open source machine learning framework. This does make use of GPUs for some training algorithms, though it's mostly experimental at this point in INCOG. INCOG makes use of neural networks, hidden Markov models, support vector machines, and many other machine learning algorithms. You can see the link here to find out more information about INCOG. Your graphics card, or GPU, graphic process unit, is normally used just for video and game playing. GPGPU is what this is often called where you use the GPU for general purpose programming. This is called general purpose computing on graphic processing units, GPGPU. This uses the GPU to greatly speed up certain parts of computer programs. This is typically used for mathematically intense applications. It is definitely not ethical for every sort of program. A single mid to high end GPU can accelerate a mathematically intense process. Multiple GPUs can be replaced to use a grid of computers. This can sometimes use less power and have less upkeep costs than maintaining a grid of traditional computers. Over the last few years, there have been many cases where desktop supercomputers were created, where you basically used seven GPUs in the case of this computer, which was called the Fastra 2 desktop supercomputer. It was built by the University of Antwerp. It used 2.8 kilowatts of power, and it was built with gamer hardware. These are regular GPUs that you would use to play video games with. As we will see soon, there are special GPUs that were created expressly with the idea of being used for computation. Fastra 2 was a fairly well-known project at the time. It received much attention on Slashdot and other media sources at the time because it made use of ordinary GPUs to do very extraordinary high-level supercomputing power. Let's look at the type of hardware that you might need to use a GPU for general purpose computing. There are really three major players as far as the hardware is concerned. There is Intel, AMD, and NVIDIA. Intel does provide drivers for GPU processing as um, general purpose computing, but it's really not a focus for Intel. Besides, Intel is heavily invested in the CPU market. This leaves AMD and NVIDIA. AMD and NVIDIA are very much head-to-head -head in the gaming market. However, in the GPU general purpose market, GeForce, or I'm sorry, NVIDIA is the main player. NVIDIA has three levels of GPUs available, the GeForce, the Quadro, and the Tesla. The GeForce is gamer hardware. GeForces are extremely powerful, uh, especially the higher end ones, but they are mainly meant for gaming. Some of the differences you can see between GeForce and the higher level is GeForce, for one, requires that a display be present to be used. So you can't start one of these up as a Windows service or this sort of thing uh, with the default drivers that are provided for them. Another thing is GeForce is not as advanced as Quadro or Tesla at transferring data back from the GPU to the computer. 
you think about it, a game doesn't really transfer data back from the GPU all that much. Data is sent to the GPU and rendered very quickly to produce a frame. Another difference is GeForce does not handle doubles as well as it does floats. Double precision works a lot better with Quadro and Tesla. Quadro is the next level up. I already explained most of the differences between Quadro and GeForce. There's a lot of um, differences in terms of Quadro would probably be used for a desktop CAD CAM machine. Tesla, you really don't buy Tesla cards by themselves. You can buy Quadro and GeForce, but Tesla is the highest end for general purpose GPU. These are typically found in the data center. And to obtain a Tesla card, you are usually buying a specially made computer that has that Tesla already embedded in it. You don't just go to Amazon and buy this sort of a card. So let's look at how a game actually uses a GPU. This is important to consider because we'll see some of the limitations of when a general purpose program makes use of a GPU. So how do games use the GPU? 32-bit is usually sufficient precision for a video game. That's why only the higher end GPUs support really advanced use of double precision. Computation is in very short term, computationally intensive bursts or frames. It's rendering a frame and then moving on to the next frame. Rarely does data return. The frame is rendered and we move on. Returning the data is where some of the higher end GPUs really excel. You don't need that for a video game, yet it's very important for GPU programming. GPU does hold some data, such as textures, that is relevant between frames. The math is important, branching is not. This is done to allow the math to be processed very fast, but if statements don't typically work that well on a GPU. Here is the GPU that I use in my desktop computer. It's a GTX 580. There are more advanced GPUs on the market now, such as the 6 series, but this is still a pretty powerful gamer class GPU. Installing a monster like this into your computer is less than trivial. Usually it's best to start with one of these and build a computer around it. I actually chose to upgrade a Dell to make use of this. Now it was a Dell Studio Line desktop, so it was a decently sized high-end Dell. It just did not have, it had a quad-core CPU, but did not have a particularly good graphics card. This was a fairly involved operation. I ended up replacing the power supply, moving the hard drive to get it out of the way, and actually modifying the case slightly with a hacksaw so that things would all fit. So let's look at some of the frameworks, at least at the very lowest level. CUDA and OpenCL are two of the main ways that you can speak to a GPU. CUDA is NVIDIA's own low-level GP GPU framework. If you're using CUDA, you're using NVIDIA. OpenCL is the more general purpose one, and this is the main focus of this presentation. OpenCL allows CPUs, GPUs, and other devices to all be virtualized to use the same programming. This makes it very easy to utilize both your GPU and your CPU simultaneously to get the most processing power out of your computer. CUDA, on the other hand, leaves making use of the, G of the CPU itself completely up to you. It is GPU only. So let's look at some of the pros and cons of CUDA. The reasons to use CUDA it has direct support for BLAS through KuBLAS. That's actually very important. This prevents you from having to write all of your math routines yourself. BLAS is a very common linear algebra package to use. It provides better performance on NVIDIA hardware, 
and CUDA is more mature than OpenCL. Reasons not to use CUDA is there's no direct support for CPU, GPU, and it does lock your application into NVIDIA. Reasons to use OpenCL. OpenCL supports GPUs, CPUs, and other devices. OpenCL has wider hardware support than CUDA. Reasons not to use OpenCL. It's not optimal if you're only targeting NVIDIA. If you're creating something for a supercomputing platform that has chosen to use NVIDIA, you might as well be using CUDA. It's what it was designed for. However, if you're creating a consumer application that will be installed on a wide variety of computers, OpenCL might be a better choice as it will allow your application to work on the widest variety of hardware. So now let's look at a technology stack. At the highest level, you have some sort of a framework written in Java that you are communicating down through the layers. This talk is focusing mainly on LWJGL, or the lightweight Java gaming library. LWJGL completely encapsulates the JNI interface. Now, JNI is Java Native Interface. OpenCL and CUDA are both C and Fortran level APIs. So you can't directly call OpenCL or CUDA from Java. You gotta use JNI. Using JNI is really painful. You're wrapping everything. This is encapsulated by LWJGL. Compared to some other frameworks, LWJGL really does a good job of looking very much like the actual OpenCL API, like you would find in the instruction manual for OpenCL, yet also hiding you from the JNI that you have to deal with. The JNI then calls either CUDA or OpenCL. CUDA goes right to the NVIDIA GPU, whereas OpenCL might be speaking to a GPU from NVIDIA, or it might be dealing with an Intel GPU or an AMD GPU. OpenCL is designed to give you the most amount of underlying hardware options, whereas CUDA is tied directly at NVIDIA. You're dealing with native code, so that's why this technology stack is the way that it is. You have left the pure Java world if you are using this sort of technology. CUDA and OpenCL are both implemented as APIs that are accessible from C++ or Fortran. Fortran is not dead yet by any stretch of the imagination. It still has its place in high-performance computing. It will even outperform C on certain cases. Java cannot directly access CUDA or OpenCL. Native code must be used. As I said in the previous slide, JNI is used to access these. This is one great thing about LWJGL is it encapsulates completely the JNI that you would have to use to access the underlying OpenCL. Here are some of the higher level GPU APIs available for Java. I've used each of these, and they have their relative strengths and weaknesses. My first choice is LWJGL. I feel that it provides the truest interface into OpenCL with minimal overhead. Jokul was my previous um, first choice, but Jokul does not exposes too much of the JNI, I feel, to the Java applications that it makes them look somewhat convoluted. JCUDA is a good choice if you want to use the underlying CUDA um, framework. I'm not focusing on CUDA in this discussion, so I'm not really considering that. Uh, Aperi is a AMD thing that completely encapsulates, um, you, it uses pure Java code to actually communicate to the GPU. We will see that many of these others require you to create a kernel actually in OpenCL. The kernel source code is based on C99, so it's 
a lot more low level than Java. The promise of Apari is that it allows you to program everything in Java and it takes the Java bytecode and translates it into the underlying kernel. I find though that when I create kernels, I'm very often tweaking at a very, very low level the memory access and how the kernel is actually constructed. So because of that, you're not allowed to do that sort of a conversion or tweaking with a Prappy. And I'm not totally sure I am pronouncing that acronym correctly, but A-P-A-R-A-P-I. It's an AMD way of directly using Java and not learning the underlying. This concludes part one. Please continue with part two to see more of this presentation.